The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and welcome to the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, with a great show for you today. We're talking about the next generation of agriculture. We're talking about the kids, the youth, the people that we are going to be reliant upon for our food and fiber and fuel production in a decade or so. We're talking to Bryce McIntosh. Bryce is a school teacher, a VOAG instructor, if you will, in Wheatland, Wyoming. Uh, Bryce is going to be joining us to talk about all things future, as it turns out, uh, uh, what we're teaching, what we aren't teaching, what the kids are doing, and what the whole thing looks like based on them. Bryce, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. So here's the deal, uh, dear listener and viewer, and I do say viewer because, as I always remind you, that for the last year or so, we have been not just recording this as an audio. You can go get this podcast wherever you get your podcast, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, whatever. You also can go online and watch it or just listen to it. It's the Damian Mason channel. Just go on YouTube and type in Damian Mason channel. Please hit subscribe. It will help me get more viewership. And you know what? It doesn't cost you a dime. You can see all my other stuff, my do business is better podcast, my ag commentary, and even some of my old videos. Hell, if you're really bored, you can find some of my old comedy videos from when I was a Bill Clinton impersonator on the Damian Mason channel. So now that I've told you all about that, I also need to remind you that this episode has a uh, fantastic sponsor. It's a company that's been with me for over years, Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution for agricultural enterprises. If you need software to manage the millions of dollars of capital you have, the inflows, the outflows, the acres, the, my God, it's beyond using a Pioneer seed corn pen pad in your truck, right? Let's get some software. Go to harvestprofit.com to see if you can find a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. All right, Bryce, I teed this up. I said what we're going to talk about. Here's the deal. Our listeners and viewers need to understand, you know, I, I deliver presentations at ag events all over the North America, and I was had the pleasure to be in Wyoming in April at the FFA convention. They got like a thousand kids. There's only half a million people in the whole freaking state, but they got like a thousand kids in this auditorium in Cheyenne, FFA. Those kids stood and put their hands on their hearts during the national anthem, said the Pledge of Allegiance. I made you tear up because there's something really, really good about our future as it comes out. As it turns out, it's the future of our business, and it's because they're, we're raising them right still in agriculture. So I started talking to Bryce. I said, you know, I'd like Bryce, I'd like you to come on my podcast and talk about things that you see and what I see. So here's the thing. I get excited when I see these kids. I was very proud. I think people like you are doing a great job as much as I, I gripe about things like the teachers unions trying to keep the kids out of school. It doesn't happen in Wyoming. It doesn't happen in agriculture. So we got good people like you. So anyway, tell me a little bit about your background. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I am 34 years old. I've been teaching for the past 10 years. I've been kind of around the state of Wyoming. Um, I've also worked in a career field other than teaching because I know the old saying, you know, those who can't teach. Um, so I actually went out and, and actually got my hands dirty for a few years, but I grew up in agriculture. Agriculture is my passion. I love it. Um, I grew up on a 240 acre alfalfa ranch farm, I should say. Um, my family and I, put up alfalfa hay, all the old fashioned way, flood irrigating with six and a half miles of pipe that we put out, picked up three times every year. Um, by the time I was 14, all my brothers had graduated, gone off to school. I was left at home running the farm by myself. I mean, I, so I've, I can actually say I've lived it. I love it. I strive for it. And that's kind of what drove me into ag education. Um, so uh, I graduated. Go you ahead. said you're 34 years old. You uh, you were out That's there right. when you were a kid doing that. See, you and I, we didn't even know this about each other. I was on a very capital unintensive, labor intensive dairy operation growing up. And we used to do 10,000 small bales of hay and straw. Uh, they bought a round baler when I went to Purdue. Somehow, when I left, then That's they became <laughs> less labor intensive uh, there on the dairy farm. So I said, That's where my back went. Um, but um, 
you worked in the industry and you came into being a school teacher. Uh, you're a University of Wyoming graduate. I am a UW graduate. Yes, sir. There you go. go Cowboys. I'm uh, I'm a big fan. Um, you you've been in, you've been around it. You've been in the industry. Uh, you also you you've got relatives that still they feed cattle there, right? Yep, my family owns and operates a seven thousand head feed yard. Uh, we custom feed synchronized uh, heifers for any customer, I guess that's within a radius that they're looking to transport livestock. Okay, mm-hmm. now if my, if my non-ag listeners are listening to this, they're saying synchronized heifers. That's two words. I don't know what that even means. What's a synchronized heifer for those that are not in the, not in the ag? So when we synchronize heifers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the the cattleman an endpoint um, of less labor. So we're trying to synchronize their estrus cycle and make sure that we're tightening that calving window so that, you know, you're not like me and calving six months of the year, we can actually tighten her up a little bit. And it just helps out on the other end of things when you go to calv and you're not checking. Right. You know. So synchronizing to the, the uh, person, a heifer is a, is, a, is a bovine female that has not yet had a calf. And synchronization, what he's talking about is syncing up their breeding cycle so that they have their drop their calves all within maybe 30 to 45 days versus all year round, is what you're saying. That's yeah. correct. Uh, you got to be a school teacher. You've got your finger on the pulse of things. You, uh, you are a real live, uh, you know, background in farming, ranching, whatever. And then you're, you're a VOAG instructor. Um, what does a VOAG program look like? You know, I was in this, but I graduated from high school in 1988. I remember taking livestock nutrition, I did livestock production, uh, you know, soils. I was going to be in agronomy. I got a lot out of my VOAG classes, and I also was in FFA. I was the only member of the Mason family, all nine of us kids. I was the only one that ever was in FFA. What's it look like now that it maybe didn't look like in 1987? Um, you know, I think I could probably sum that up with one word, unique. I would say that ag programs across the nation now are becoming so individualized and unique. And truly the way I would describe it is I try to meet my community's needs. So even in the small state of Wyoming, like you said, we're less, you know, right at a half a million people. Hell, I think we were almost up to 600,000 now with this last census. You know, don't short us here. But, right. but, but I look at it as every community is a little bit different. And when we really sit down and look at the numbers of this, I would say that the better part of 60 to 70 percent of my kids are going to come back to this community. So if I can give them skills that are really relevant to here, that's where I start with my program. Um, But I also don't want to limit them to, hey, what if you end up in Florida? What if you end up in Alaska, Maine? So I would say let's start with saying that every program is going to be quite a bit different. But I'm also going to say that it probably hasn't changed a lot from 1987. It's, it's still kind of the same principles. What we're trying to do though, is advance it as much as we can and try to keep up with the times. Um, my, my current program has, uh, basically we start kids off with breeds of livestock. We start with terminology of livestock. So, you know, we're teaching kids just, hey, what, what is livestock? What are our major species? What are breeds of livestock? What are our uh, sexes of livestock called within the industry? And then we go on to do some animal science and plant science where we actually break down and we teach quite a lot of biological principles in my animal science class, a lot of anatomy and physiology. Mm -hmm. Um, We go to plant science and it's kind of the same thing. I incorporate agronomy in there. We move up into ag business, which is what I kind of pride my program on. Um, I try to make sure that my kids can leave here with some real world skills. That's, that's the basis of ag education for me is I want you ready for life more than what you learn in my class. Let's give you some skills that you can actually walk out the door and, and put to use. And that business class to me, every kid in the nation should probably have to take something like that. And if they're not, then I think that's where we're going wrong. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, one thing that uh, you and I talk about is why I want to get you on here is because um, you're 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 a little forward thinking um you're you're not old and stuck in your ways you're a young guy but also you and i both agreed that some of the stuff we do in ag we're still a little yesteryear and um by that i mean it's not 1950s anymore um you know we've always focused on production that's important it's what we do in ag but the reality is when my father took Purdue short course or even in the 1980s when i'm there in voag classes it was about, damn, do you think we could ever get to 200 bushel corn? Well, we're 
250 bushel corn, you know? So the production thing is, is there. We're darn good at it. And production is really not our problem as much more. The kids need that foundation. But like you said, it's the business thing. Um, what's the biggest observation you have about like what, what excites them? I mean, do they get, do they, they get excited about seeing this stuff, you know, going to greenhouse or pulling like, lamb or what? Let's start with this, Damien. I, I tell my kids on day one when they walk in my class, and I won't lie, I pissed a lot of parents off. I pissed a lot of people in agriculture off. But when you really stop and think about what I'm about to say, I think it'll make a lot of sense. Day one, they walk into my class and I say, kids, you know, there's about two ways to get into production agriculture, marry it or inherit it. <laughs> because anymore, it's getting so expensive to have that upfront capital to just dive in head first that you know, every kid that comes in my program for the most part has that dream that, man, I just want to go on my own farm and ranch. And yeah. the reality of it, like you're saying, is we're going to have to start pushing them into uh, some specialty areas in agriculture and, and giving them the skills. But on, on the flip side of that, I don't want to limit them because I'm here to tell you there's some of these kids that are just tickled to grow up and, and run the tractor with mom and dad or run the tractor with grandpa and I even have my uncle who calls me every day and says, man, you got to send me somebody who can drive a damn feed truck. I just need that skill. Somebody's got to be able to do it. So I, I don't want to push people away from that either because we are lacking in having those kind of job labor skills out there where people are, are just willing to go out and, and dive head first into these jobs. So. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, you know, um, like Purdue where I went a couple of years ago, sent out a thing that said for the first time ever, a majority of the kids in the School of Agriculture are not from a farm background. Clearly, back in the old days, if you were in the School of Agriculture, 80, 90 percent chance you were from a farm. Well, there's less kids per married couple uh, or divorced couple, whatever. There's less kids. Uh, there's less farms because we've gotten so darn good at consolidation through, you know, technological innovation. And so there's, a, like you said, there's a how many of your kids are not actually from the farm and ranch? Is there 20 percent of your kids that aren't? I would go on to, and say the better part of 30 to 40, even in a small town, rural Wyoming. I mean, yeah. you know, face it anymore, less than 1% of people are, are involved directly in production agriculture. And when we look at those statistics, even in a small town, it proves to be pretty true. You have your, your farm and ranch kids and, you know, I'm blessed to have them. Um, but I also like to promote a lot of this agriculture stuff to my kids that don't have a clue about it. And, it's really hard to teach these kids the advanced stuff or, hey, let's take it to a niche market without get it, giving them that base yeah. of what is production ag. So, I mean, we do still have to have to teach that foundation principles because it's really hard for me to tell a kid what precision agriculture is without saying, here's what agriculture is. Yeah. So that's that's the thing is that while I'm on the one hand saying we don't need to we don't necessarily need kids to just know how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, drive a corn planter. But the reality is, if you don't know that, you're not going to get to the next level, the next level, the next level. Um, so the basics, uh, you got these kids and you said one of the last classes, so I'm assuming this is more like juniors and seniors take the ag business stuff. And the reality is it's business no matter what. So whether they end up working for the local ag industry or whether they end up in any other career, they've got the business. So tell me about ag business. What's that look like? Ag business, uh, well, we start with financial statements. So we're teaching kids how to set up a balance sheet. Um, we're teaching them what a cash flow is. We're looking at the statement of owner's equity. We're making them run balance sheet equations. We're, I, I put together a project that we kind of patented in my class called the College Budget Project. And um, my kids seem to really like this because we actually say, what are the actual costs of going to college? And I mean, we include everything. Um, all your utilities, uh, your travel costs back and forth of fuel, because most of these kids are going to drive back home and see mom and dad. So we include your gas costs. Uh, we include cost of tuition fees, room and board. We're including, you know, some fun money while you're at college because we all like to have a little fun. I mean, I try to be real. So, and we actually pencil it out and we say, what does this look like now over the course of four years? And do you need that degree to do what you want to do? And I, I got to tell you, my dad, he made a lot of sense. Uh, a few years ago, I had a student that he wanted to go to Sheridan College and major in carpentry. And my dad said, young man, how about I just save you the money? You come work for me 
and I will pay you to get that carpentry degree and I will teach you more than you're going to learn in that school. Mm -hmm. When we sat down and ran that college budget project, it kind of just clicked for him that, man, yeah, I'd have to be an idiot to go pay somebody to teach me when I could actually go make money and learn with the hands-on skills. I think teaching these kids about money in my book, Do Business Better, I have uh, one of the habits of success I said is no money or you'll have no money. And I remember putting this chapter together and I had a friend of mine proof it. And I said, I think this is really beneath uh, people. It almost might be insulting. He said, well, the average household has $14,000 of credit card debt. And the average net worth in America is like a ridiculously low amount. He said, so I don't think that you're beneath people when you're explaining the fundamentals of money and business, like you just said that the young folks that you're working with, you're saying, all right, what's a balance sheet? Uh, you know, I've had grown adults that I that are in business. And I said, so what's your balance sheet look like? And they said, uh, <laughs> it's just the thing with the assets on one side and the liabilities on the other. Uh, and I'm not sure they knew what those two words were either. We're talking to Bryce McIntosh. He's the instructor of OAG guy, FFA guy in Wheatland, Wyoming. We're going to talk about the future of ag, and uh, we're going to ask him some more great questions and get his take on stuff. But I want to remind you that my buddies at Harvest Profit sponsor this podcast. Got Land Trust as a sponsor. I got my good friends at Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution for agriculture. You need, speaking of money, to manage your money, and you might need software to do so. Harvest Profit, a bunch of my listeners have actually gone to, to harvestprofit.com and, and acquired their products. It'll make your life easier, it'll make your business more profitable. Go to harvestprofit.com for a software solution that works as hard as you do. FFA. All right, talking about agribusiness management. You said you do livestock production, crop production. Um, I remember learning about animal nutrition. I still apply those things today. I shot a video and explained to folks, Bryce, this bull crap about superfoods. I said, they know such thing. I don't care what Dr. Oz says. There's just food. And I said, I learned it in livestock nutrition, in livestock production. You've got the six elements of nutrition, right? And I think the average person doesn't know this either. Carbohydrates, fat, protein, vitamins, mineral, water. That's it. Nothing super. <laughs> There's a superfood. Anyways, you're teaching that stuff. What do the kids like the most? Honestly, I think we, I, I would say tends, uh, kids tend to follow kind of what the ag teacher is passionate about. My big right. passion is reproduction. Um, I've been playing around with embryo transfer and artificial insemination here for the past few years. We also run a kind of a show steer operation, a um, couple of buddies and I. And so embryo transfer has become a pretty big passion of mine. So we get pretty in depth into that. And we bring some microscopes in and we thaw out some semen and check it out under a microscope. We actually look at some embryos under a microscope and then we actually go do an embryo transfer process at, at our place where we set up and have the doc come down and he's teaching the kids kind of the process. And, and that seems to really excite them. Um, and believe it or not, you know, the business side of things is really starting to excite kids. Yeah, that's good. That's 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 the that's the part that I'm excited about. By the way, I'm I'm not as excited now that I'm running this in my head. The guy that's teaching our future is also into show steers. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, that he spends ten thousand dollars for a steer and to take it, drive it around the countryside and win a 30 cent ribbon. So you always gotta wonder about these livestock uh, uh, show yeah. people. The show pig people might be more wacky than the show steer people. I didn't think that was possible. And they're none of them are as wacky as horse show people. We know that, right? Now we got to back up there. See, this is where I took that corner and went into the niche market of producing them. I don't show them. I raise them and sell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always made the crack that uh, when you think of these livestock show people, Bryce, um, they drag their $10,000 steer all around the countryside in a $50,000 trailer and walk in and have a guy that's uh, chewing Copenhagen and dropped out of junior college, judge and assess whether or not you are a successful show steer person. It's always remarkable that the judges in these things like, yeah, I slept in my truck last night. The show steer people, the judges, it's like they've, uh, they, they generally live in a pickup truck and they ever notice a bunch of them own like a fourth of a cow somewhere or something. Like, yeah, I'm a quarter owner of, uh, of, of that. that. Uh, I wouldn't say all of them. I know some pretty good ones that, uh, I've actually 
been able to be become pretty good friends with. They're now professors at universities and sure. and doing well. So I mean, I, I, do you judge? Well, are you, are you a, do you do livestock judging? I do not. Not I. I mean, I coach it, but I don't judge any shows. No, sir. I took it just enough in high school boeg class that if you brought a, a production hog and then a show hog out, I could tell you which one was which. But I'm not really uh, these people that can see all the minor differences. Qualified. <laughs> um, tomorrow. What, what kind of tomorrow stuff? You know, organic wasn't really a thing at thirty some years ago when I was sitting in that classroom. Um, what what kind of stuff? What kind of tomorrow stuff are you exposing the kids to? One of our latest and greatest things is drones in agriculture. Um, my Perkins coordinator, she kind of forced this down my throat because I'm pretty old fashioned and I didn't like to just experiment with new technology as much as I used to. It's kind of funny. I used to listen to my dad complain about it. Now here I am going, damn it. I, I, last thing I want to do is computer work or drone stuff, but we've actually started to have a little fun with it. And we're actually starting to do some crop mapping and these drones, I think, you know, kind of have their place. We're actually having a class um, present a marketing plan on adding a drone to a local um, weed and pest guy here. He runs an operation, teaches at the school, sprays weeds on the side. And we're looking at seeing maybe about adding a drone to his um, spray crew because we think maybe he could start doing trees with it and be a lot more efficient than having to stand underneath trees and spray up and have everything fall down on your head. So, I mean, that's one of the big things that we're looking at. Um, plasma cam is another thing that we're really advancing ourselves in. Out in the shop, my students have a, a CNC plasma cutter where we're cranking out signs and we try to run that as a business in the shop to fundraise some of our FFA stuff to go up and down the road. So, I mean, there's lots of technology I think that that is evolving. Um, I would love to get more advanced into that, but I think that CNC stuff is becoming really, really big. Mm -hmm. It's so unaffordable for schools to get all the equipment in here to give those kids the skills. So we got to teach what we can with what we can, but you know, that's to me, the future is, is more precision. Um, it, it's more technology mm -hmm. and it's, it's, these kids are going to be fantastic at it because this is their right. uprising. I mean, they've grown up with it. They're yep. 10 to one better than me in this stuff. Yeah. There's, there's no question. Uh, you said you can be pretty outspoken. You, uh, you're not afraid to ruffle some feathers. What stuff is not being instructed to the future of agriculture? What uh, are they not getting that they should? I, I think that we're still, you know, at some point, and, and somebody's going to take this the wrong way, so I hope your viewers, you know, listen carefully here. But at some point, we've got to reel kids back into reality and stop telling every kid that, listen, your dream is going to become a reality. You know, as much as I want that to happen for every kid that I teach, we also need to be making sure that, you know, you're going to go out and become successful. Um, and so one of the things that I think is, is invaluable to me is this whole idea that you need to have a degree to become a teacher. Yep. Says who? Some of the best teachers I've ever taught with don't have degrees. They just have that factor that they're able to work with kids. And, and I think that's becoming more and more important today as we're losing teachers. You're seeing some of these teachers unions not want to go back to school because of COVID grow up. I mean, yeah. for the love of God, if you're really in it for the kid, then what the hell are you doing? Yeah. So I, I look at it as education is only as valuable as the source that it comes from. And to me, some of these sources are getting pretty shitty, mm -hmm. uh, to be frank. We, we've got to say, uh, follow the book or follow the way that, that it was designed to be taught rather than you take your own turn and teach how you interpret it, how you want it to read. And, and I think when we can start doing that in every field of education, then we start getting a lot stronger in education as a country. Yeah, I, I think that's probably uh, that's, that's a good statement, by the way. You know, speaking of which, there's the thing that uh, I have rallied against and railed against this whole thing that every kid needs to go to college, period, um, to be successful. Man, the trades, the trades need the trades need hands. Uh, and, and um, you know, you and I both went to college. but I don't certainly have any uh, inkling that says, oh, boy, that's the only path there should ever be. I think mean, it's neat that you're teaching your kid how to use a plasma cutter and doing all that stuff. They still do like welding and that kind of thing, practical stuff. 
We still do welding. I, I actually teach the welding side of things here as well. So we include that plasma cam within our welding sections. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, like back to what you just said there, I think there's more teacher or more people out there that are hell of a lot more qualified to be teaching agriculture than myself, just because I have a four year degree. So, you know, the, the idea for me becomes, uh, who are we sending to go get their masters and PhDs to come back and tell us how to do all of this stuff when they've probably never been in the field a day in their life. And apparently all you got to do is go back to school and just become more educated. And all of a sudden you're the master of all of these things and you know how to do it. And I'm not trying to offend anybody. My wife has two master's degrees. She's extremely smart in math. Right. But the reality is, is we've got people equally as smart that don't have these degrees, but we've told them they're not qualified to do the job. And I think that's a sad day, especially in our field where we're lacking now those, those career fields where we need more kids with hands-on skills. Well, some of the best teachers are out there that don't have the degree to come teach, but they would teach it just fine. Yeah. I, I think there's uh, that's absolutely dead on. And, uh, and, and, you know, entrepreneurialism, I haven't had a real job for 27 years, but I've always had, uh, you know, different things that uh, are making me money. And uh, I, I made the point in my book that I, sat in on an entrepreneur class at the high school level and the person that was instructing it had never been in, in business in, in, in her life. And uh, it's not, nothing mean, it's just that that's, that's who was teaching the class. And then, so um, uh, that happened. So <clears throat> you have, have an opinion about this too, I'm sure. All these <laughs> FFA kids, they're not going to be in production agriculture, but that's fine. Still a tremendous amount of stuff. And I saw those kids getting their recognitions for all the competitions they do and all that. But we do have this thing that we create a lot of an ag. Um, then they want to become ag communicators and advocates. I've been called an advocate, and I've said, please don't refer to me as that because that is not a word. Also, it's overused. Passionate advocates. What do you think? I'm going to start with saying I think that there's a place in agriculture for it. But I'm also going to say I don't agree that we should just start cranking kids out and being these advocates. Um, you know, let's let's talk about this. We've got 600,000 people in the state of Wyoming. And of those, I would bet you probably 30 to 40 percent are taking an ag class and going through it. Let's let's take a look at what New York has, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so everybody wants to say, well, let's be an advocate and let's reach these people. And you and I got to talking at state convention about this. That's all great, but we're probably advocating to the same type of people who have already heard the story. So how do we get the story to the millions of people in New York City, in California, in Florida, in these places where they don't understand agriculture is what we need to focus on. And, and when you, you know, the more I think about this question, when you said, what are we not teaching? We're probably not teaching a basic agriculture class to those bigger states that really need a foundation principle of where their food and fiber comes from so that they can just have an idea of growing up. And, and like I say, it's as good as the source. So we need good ag teachers to teach that class, yep. to teach them how it's actually done and not the way perception see. Yeah, that would be an amazing thing. It's a battle we have. And, and you and I both agree on this because I stated a long time ago, I used to be out there on social media telling ag people about the wonderful things about ag. And it dawned on me, I'm doing what I always tell them not to do. I'm preaching to the choir. So now I've changed my focus more about here's the problem. Here's what we got. I'm bringing the information to them instead of being rah, rah. Like I'm not going to be a downer. I'm just going to tell you the reality out here because you got enough people advocating on social media telling you, and we're farmers, we're good. Like, okay, great. You just told a bunch of people, you know, it's like I always said that if ag was a person, it'd be the crazy guy on a park bench muttering to himself because we talk to ourselves all the freaking time. <laughs> We need to teach more ag. I agree with that. Um, we need to have uh, one just one semester that the masses in the suburbs of Chicago could learn about. That would be fantastic. I don't know what's going to happen. What are we getting wrong with the university level? You know, the kids leave you and you put them out there, the ones that do go to college. What are they What are they doing there that I, I've got my opinions about what yours. What's happening at the university level, good and bad? Well, I, I think it kind of depends on the university again. I think a lot of these land grant universities are are shoving a lot of research down teachers throats. And I think there's a lot of teachers who could do a phenomenal job if their administration would just sit back and say teach. But instead, they are forced to do research for the university and publish papers and research for them. It's it becomes the point of are we serving the kid or are we serving the university? And to me, if we're trying to better the education, 
in the United States of America, it has to be focused on the kid. And that's where I think we're probably getting it wrong. Um, I know the University of Wyoming, I'm going to give her a shout out real fast. I think that professor there is doing a hell of a job. She's done nothing but good things since she took the program on. Uh, she's raising numbers. She's educating the, the school. You're talking about the school of school of ag at school of ag ed, correct? And so, I think she's doing some good things there, cranking out more ag teachers and and quality ag teachers. I will say. So I think again, it just depends on the program. Um, but let me ask you this, Damien. Uh, okay, you, you want to go to the university and get an animal science degree. What are you going to do with it other than become a vet or maybe take some of that stuff back home and and apply it to to your place. I mean, is that something that we could teach in high school ag class where you've got enough of it to feel successful or do you need to go get that for your degree? So, yeah. you know, I, I agree. A friend of mine has a daughter that's going to go to the university uh, to my, where I went and pursue animal science. And I said, become a vet. No, probably not. Maybe like something in animal care. And I said, well, okay. And vet assistant. But the point is um, besides that, <laughs> I have a brother-in-law with a degree in animal science. He was a hog farmer. Now he's a real estate appraiser. I mean, so it seems to be um, that we've got plenty of them. One thing back to your statement, I think the land-grant university system is fantastic. I wrote about it in my book, how amazing the land-grant system is. But I'm afraid that some of these institutions have lost sight of their uh, what they were incarnated to do, what their, what their vision was in the 1860s when the whole thing was put together. It was, uh, you know, in pursuit of uh, the, uh, you know, the engineering and, and agricultural uh, sciences. And um, it seems like some of those universities, are, like you said, just chasing research dollars. Um, <clears throat> what's good about today's young ag people? What's good about them? I saw them. I was excited to see them there. Um, I, was, I think they have a lot of confidence. I met another Damian Mason, in fact spelled like mine, if I'm not mistaken, who uh, who uh, is, is in ag in Wyoming. What do you see that's good that excites you about the future? I would say that it excites me that there's still parents out there raising their kids with work ethic, with compassion, with motivation, and that, that drive to go get things done. Um, I've said it a million times, you couldn't pay me to be a math teacher or a science teacher. Um, my heart's an ag because not only that's what I love, but those are the type of kids that I really enjoy. Um, what are the kids lacking when, and, and it's not in any way picking on any of them. What, are, what is it? Is it, are they lacking from their upbringing or are they lacking that we're not doing right? What's, what's, what's lacking? One, one of the things that drives me the most nuts is the, the technology that always has to be at their hands for that instant gratification piece. Um, Sometimes we just need to set those things down and learn that we've got a job to do. And that that's probably the driving force in my class that I see a lot of where I say, guys, I, you got to put those things up. I know that it's gratifying to talk to your buddies and, and snap them and whatever it is that you do. But it's disrespectful. And we've got to learn that, hey, when you come, we're going to treat this just like a job. You're here from basically eight o'clock to three thirty. So for eight to three thirty, I need you to treat this like a job because we do kind of a survey when we send our kids out from our career field and we say, you know, what skills do you wish kids had? What skills do you see that they do have? And what are some things that we need to be changing? And always on that survey, it's they can't put their phones up and work. Yeah, and I was really impressed and standing in front of a thousand of these kids in April doing a presentation. I did not see any phones on. And I know that there's somebody that uh, made that rule, but if you were in front of a thousand high school kids in any other setting, they would all be on their phones. I, I agree with that. Um, I think that uh, when I, you know, I've got nieces and nephews, I pay attention. It seems like there's um, the, the thing that I would say is being a farm kid, I knew how to do a lot of stuff. You know, I still know how to do a lot of stuff. I, I, I'm not a mechanic, but I can mechanic my way off, <laughs> off a desert island. You know, I'm not a painter, but by God, I can paint. You know, I can do a lot of these things. And um, since the kids don't have that experience, they tend to be really good at doing stuff with their thumbs, but they're not really broad based. And so that's where I think a program like yours is real helpful because you're exposing them to that. What are we not covered that we need to cover when we're talking about the future of ag from your perspective? You know, I, I really do believe that the future of ag is looking bright. I know that people, 
people get depressed and people get looking down on things. And I'm here to tell you, I've cranked out some really good kids. And, and to me, the future actually looks really bright. Um, I've got kids that come in motivated every day to be in my class. They're excited to learn. They're going on to universities or going straight out into the field of agriculture, and they're going to be leaders for tomorrow. And I'm, I'm just taking this on a whim, but I'm hoping that there's other teachers out there like myself that have the same passion, the same drive. And if they do, I'm not fearful of agriculture tomorrow at all. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with that assessment. And um, I, like I said, I think they do need hands on stuff. Um, I, I think that the tough part is that we need to get, the, the, you know, I think that they need to get a little dirty and then you get their hands on some stuff. But I feel pretty confident about the whole thing, too. I, I uh, wish there was a way that we could, in, in lieu of all of this, let's go get a four year degree. I wish there was a way we could set up more internships or more uh paid placements to take kids directly after high school and get them excited about something, you know, Hey, you think this farming thing's all it's cracked up to be, let's take you over here and get you paid for two years. And if you don't like it, well, you're not out $60,000 of a college degree. And you just made the decision right there that, Hey, this maybe isn't for you. And I, I just don't know. Sometimes it gets hard to pay these kids. That would be the other thing is their, their expectations sometimes are just a little bit high and, and again, to be frank, sometimes we just got to learn that you got to be the bitch before you can be the boss. <laughs> yeah. Well, high expectations is probably not a bad thing. It's actually, it's, it's, if it's drive uh, and ambition toward that, it's one thing, but if it's expectation um, that uh, is uh, sort of like I'm owed this, then that's always a bad thing. So um, I really appreciate you being on here, giving us a little glimpse because, you know, some of these people are listening to this. Their kids are done, gone and raised and all that. And they're like, what do, what do things look like from uh, from your perspective out there in Wheatland, Wyoming? His name is Bryce McIntosh. If somebody has a question, what do they got to do? Email you, find you at Wheatland High School? They can email me. They can. Uh, yeah, I probably don't want to throw my phone number out there. Nah, I wouldn't do that. Text, but. Bryce so Mac, anytime. Bryce, Bryce Mac five, Bryce Mac five, that's Bryce with an I, Mac five at yahoo.com. Um, because there might be somebody that also wants to be a VOAG teacher and maybe yep. wants to ask you what that's like. You know, we just had a student teacher this last semester from Oklahoma State. Um, we were supposed to get her on here, and I think she's going to do a fantastic job. That, that also is promising. That tells me that the future is looking good because they're cranking out quality teachers. Um, so, so that was exciting to have her for a semester. The kids seemed to love her. She brought a different perspective being from, you know, an Oklahoma college versus a Wyoming college. She was able to teach a few things a little different than I was and it was good. So, yeah, it, it is good. And that was, uh, I, I enjoyed meeting her as well. So, uh, and now she's, now you, you gotta be back to being on your own. You don't have your student teacher. Anymore. Yep. Yeah. All right. His name is Bryce McIntosh. My name is Damian Mason. Land Trust and Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit, again, software solution. You need software to run your business like a business. We talked about money and business. Bryce is teaching it to his young people. You know what? They need to also understand that business is supposed to make a profit. Get yourself a software solution that works as hard as you do. Go to harvestprofit.com. See if they have a product that will fit your needs. I'm sure they do. Thanks for being on here, Bryce. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate your insight. Maybe we'll do it again in a couple of years when you can tell me what's new in the world of uh, VOAG. And you know what, folks, do get excited. It's our yeah. future, right? It's our future. We need these. We need these people to fill our roles and our jobs in another few years. And, and Bryce is preparing them right now. It's like I tell everybody. You know, it's like the election. Even if your candidate didn't win, you still got to want them to do good. And it's just like our future of agriculture. Yeah. Even if you don't maybe believe in your heart that we're headed the right direction, you still gotta want them to do good, and I think things will happen. So yeah, and we need and we need about them. The, and and we and we need them. You know, we we need these roles filled. So, all right, thanks for being on here, buddy. Thanks for having me. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the Business of Agriculture podcast, sponsored by Land Trust. Land Trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities, and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.